This is Scott Kegler. I'm here at the Web 3.0 conference for 2010, and I'm here with Tom Gruber, Siri, mm -hmm. uh, current project mm -hmm. of one of many in a series, right? Yes. And um, and so we'll, I guess we'll let's start start talking about Siri and just uh, give me an idea of of what that is and um, how obviously how semantics is is being leveraged there. Yeah. Well, Siri is, is uh, what we call a virtual personal assistant. So it's um, it's uh, the assistant in your hand, in your in your phone, and it can do things like help you figure out what you want to do this weekend. You go to a movie or a restaurant or a, an event. It helps you, um, reminds you to do things. Mm. Uh, it uh, can help you, uh, you know, even check the weather. Just basically all the things you might do if you had an assistant on the other end of a phone line uh, with uh, internet you know, and smart. Uh, what we're doing with the, the semantic uh, technology is we're applying all the best of the web services and uh, structured data ecology mm. to this problem so we can automate the assistant, so we can produce that assistant-like feel in, uh, in a natural interface. Okay. And this is, this is a speech application on the phone? Well, it's natural language is one of the interfaces. It's actually it's, it's a semantic application in the sense that it has models of what people uh, do in their lives, uh, going out to dinner, having, doing, going to events, and so on. Right. And then it has a natural language understanding component which can take speech, it can also take typing. Okay. And in fact, we have something called semantic autocomplete, which is as you type, every character you type, it, it, it brings all the, the domain, domain semantics to bear in determining what would be the completions for that. Okay. Uh, so it's really more than just speech, but the speech is exciting because then for the first time really in history, you can just say what you want, and, right. it, and it really does, in fact, uh, help you solve a problem. Yeah. Years ago, there was an application um, and it was a it was a voice application on on the phone called Wildfire. Oh yeah, I love that. Yeah. And I you know I fell in love with her because she was great. I just pick up the phone and say call you know call Dan or whatever, and uh, it would just pick it up and it would repeat to me what I said. So it had that speech recognition component to it, but I, that's changed quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Because that vocabulary is pretty limited. That's right. I mean, the wildfire was a great example of an intermediary and an assistant. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really did just one thing. It just it, it helped uh, scan your, your communications, uh, right. drive your communications. It did extremely well, and the fact that it was a natural interface using voice was elegant. Right. Um, we're trying to generalize that concept to all kinds of things you would do with the web, for instance, or with email or social networking. Okay. Um, the, uh, the model, interestingly enough, is, is still an assistant. That is, it's still an intermediary of sorts. But now it's more like a personal assistant. Like when you okay. talk to Siri, you're mostly talking to your assistant, not someone else's assistant. Okay. And very personal. Very personal. And that yeah. changes the game. And right. now you can start trusting it with your addresses and your credit cards and your preferences and interests and your history. Okay. And now it can take that data and apply it to your problems for you. Okay. And of course, there's a, a, a I guess a, a leap to be made in that faith, mm -hmm. right? Of of the the give over my personal information. Although that leap is becoming shorter now because everything is, is everywhere. Well, yeah, trust is really key. Uh, we right. think to make this, this personal assistant uh, model work, mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be a win-win for the user and for the system. And, and the way that works really isn't that complicated. Um, you, know, you know that uh, the assistant can help you save, save you time, a, a hassle factor, it's just streamlining tasks. Mm -hmm. and if you, can, if you know that at least at the data level it's secure, and that's relatively right. easy to guarantee, then you can uh, now start saying, well, why would I want to type that, fill out that form again? Why would I do another password? Why would I do another credit card? All those things are, are uh, savable. Of course, it's all uh, it's an evolution. Sure. Uh, there'll be early adopters who trust it and understand that you can trust that technology. There'll be people who don't understand and will rightly be hesitant, but, but just use it in an anonymous way at the right. beginning. Okay. This morning we had a good time uh, talking about this thing we call the big think small screen. Okay. Which is it's kind of like why is it that all of a sudden we're starting to see intelligent applications, Siri, Wolfram Alpha, uh, these other ones, they're starting to come out of the woodwork now. Right. And especially on the mobile phone, it's really interesting. I think Pandora is another example of one where you start to see uh, intelligence of the big thinking, the big c computing over big data sets in the cloud mm. brought to bear on these brilliant little interfaces on cell phones. And right. that's because the, it's not only is the little thing capable of a brilliant interaction, it has sensors, but also that there's a decent bandwidth now, 
And then there's a colo, the, the cost of running a colocation facility and, and elastic computing in the cloud. All those things are actually combined in what we call a perfect storm mm. for these things. And, and we're going to see other applications like that. I think Siri is just the beginning. And uh, I think we're, we're hoping that the virtual personal assistant is sort of the poster child or the killer app for that, oh, yeah. for that new world. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and as you mentioned in your talk earlier, the, the, the computing function is really not in the handset at all. Yeah, not the big thing. Yeah. You have some capabilities, obviously, for capture and transmit and receive and those kind of things, but everything else is offloaded to supercomputers or yeah. whatever that is. I don't even know what supercomputers well, is. Imagine these anymore. huge farms. I mean, how Google does it, you know, these yeah. huge farms of servers. That's why it happens so fast and so incredibly well. Um, that's even how the speech works. It, it, for all the history of until the last few years, the speech was always done on device. Right. And that's why you have, like, sort of okay voice dialing, and that was about it on phones. Yep. And now you have, you know, Siri, help me plan a date this weekend. And, you know, that complicated sentence, or like I think I was, one of them I said, like, I booked me a table for two at El Fornio in San Jose for Friday night. You know, all, that kind of a, a dictation uh, it takes a fair amount of computation to do in real time. Sure. And that's now done just because the bandwidth of transmitting those, those right. bits is, is real time. And, uh, and the, the clouds are big enough, the right. computing is big enough to do it there. And the ability to make those associations in real time. That's right. Yeah, to take that and parse that at web scale, which means you know multiple per second, right. uh, being able to, to take that and make sense of it in natural language processing. Right. Now, of course, we're working hard to make it that fast. Uh, but the basic fundamental, you're in the ballpark now. It used to be just one of those things you saw in laboratories yeah. and just never made it to the light of day. Right. Uh, Moore's Law has made the compute uh, cost per machine go down a little bit, but the, really the new news is the cloud computing platform has allowed us to do sort of like lightning strikes of bursts of uh, massive parallelism or lots of computing power okay. all at once, uh, and, then, and then elastically uh, withdraw and then apply it and withdraw and de deal with the sort of mass scale that uh, consumer uh, demand mm -hmm. will produce. Yeah, in the semantic world of this conference that we're at here, mm -hmm. uh, it's been fun to watch how this has evolved. Um, we've seen the, the, the uh, rise of the Web 2.0 and the social web, right. uh, which has been basically a combination of you know, the search engine ecosystem for attention traded for money, uh, combined with the fact that computing is cheap enough where you can support everyone's data online, so right. why not? You know, right. uh, and then computing, the living in the cloud is now has become uh, life for you know, whole generations. Mm -hmm. Well, the next the next wave we keep waiting for this Web 3.0 wave, is I think starting to happen now, because we're re kind of plateauing out. How do you extract value by just matching against a bunch of content that was gathered? Uh, now we see the connections and the combinations of that information is where the value is being created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even yeah. even the simple thing like, uh, yeah, if you, if you had even a fast connection and a, your tab browsing, you put right. you know, Yelp and OpenTable and Bura and Gaio and all these sites and, and you, then the different you line them up, search and everyone, different search and everyone, and then different page formats and trying to figure out. Oh, and yeah. is that restaurant the same as that restaurant? Right, yeah. right. So all that connection, taking all those things and making them together is what the semantics is doing for us now. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. But well, I think the difference is really the transition from scaling across joining giant data sets to scaling across joining specific calls to sort of lightning strike or precision strike uh, calls to services and the over APIs. Okay. So now, um, yes, it would take, it takes a little bit of while to say data, make a data warehouse that would combine all of the data of the Yelps and, and open tables of the world into one, but that's not how we do it. Okay. So we actually call live services. And, and right. it's only possible because those services, those companies, are smart enough to open, expose APIs. Right. So they're participating in this ecosystem of APIs. And, and there's like 1,600 of them, as I said, uh, and growing right. every day. Right. Uh, and and, the, and the, the, the big game here is who's going to be the, the fit organism in this, in this uh, new ecosystem? Right. Who's going to be able to thrive in the Web 3.0 uh, ecosystem where the ability to combine and connect these services and these data sets uh, dynamically is the is the winning thing. And I think that's really a key is the the dynamic capability of mm. being able to say, oh, I need this now. Yeah. And just just this much of it. Right. Yeah.